Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Hi, my name is Adar. I'm the host on this podcast, the founder of the Digital Sisterhood, and I'm kind of, sort of, a storyteller. And my story begins with my grandmother. So my grandmother, Allah yarhamla, she passed away when I was 10, 11. My grandmother was, even at her old age, she was tall, maybe more taller than everybody else's grandma. <laughs> and uh, she always stood upright. She had great posture. Um, and I feel like, I don't think, I think naturally she wanted to curl down, but I think she fought it. And so she always walked like she was young and, and she was in charge and you could feel her presence just by her posture. She always was smiling. And when she'd look at you, it's, it was as if you, you in her eyes you can see that she's smirking. Like she is listening to what you're saying. If she has something to say or there's something she's, a conversation she's having in her head about this conversation, but you're not, she's not telling you, you know? Or that she's, or maybe that she's, uh, you know, she's happy at what you're saying, and she's surprised, you know. And so, she always had a very loving eyes. Um, she was very soft spoken, but um, when she wanted to set you straight, all of a sudden she had a different voice. It was very scary. She was always reading. I remember my grandmother. She was always reading Quran. I never saw her without her mushaf. She was either reading her Quran, or she was brushing her hair or she was telling us a story. So her room was a master bedroom, but she had a den, and I lived in her den, right? I didn't live in my parents' room, I lived in her den. And so I spent a lot of time with her, and um, I'm sure this is very relatable to anybody that has a grandmother or had a grandmother, but grandmothers share lessons, insights, perspectives through telling stories. One day, you'll talk about wanting, oh, I'm tired, I give up, and then she'll start talking about a man who had a camel in Africa. I'm like, <laughs> related to this what I'm telling you but if you just hold on and just listen long enough you'll hear that that she's trying to make a connection with you by explaining that yeah you're tired you know you're exhausting your human but you shouldn't give up especially about the things that you care or value for a while as a child I used to just be daunted because I felt like she was telling me big girl grandma stories and I was a young kid but it only made me more curious. I think my grandmother was very talented in keeping me very curious. Um, it also made me very nosy <laughs> as well, where I would ask people the most uh, intr intr intrusive questions. <laughs> and I thought they were okay because my grandmother created that space, right? I could ask any question and that was okay. And, and to always be curious and optimistic about life. And then I got to a point where her stories meant something to me. And I would go through school, elementary schools, or, you know, experiences of bullying or, you know, not feeling seen or heard. And remember the stories that she used to tell me of this person and that person and this, you know, girl and this little girl and that little girl. And I started to feel like less alone. Um, and I think when you're in that, at that age, you assume that every experience you're having is singular. <laughs> you know, you think it's just you. And so stories gave me that it's not just you very early on. So I was able to find comfort in it. And so after that, like, I became obsessed with stories. I became, you know, the, um, in Somali they call it, you know, shek, 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 hadid, right? And it's like those people that co get people to congregate and tell stories. I was like that person all the time. And oftentimes that person sounds like, um, you know, when, when, you're, when you're a friend and you're saying, it's like, oh, like, I am, for some reason my pinky hurts. And you know, there's a person that will always say, oh, I knew a person that's pinky that hurt. And then she did it. I was that <laughs> that person right oh I knew a person actually I know a story or I know this and and for me when I was telling her the story my my whole intention is to provide her comfort by telling her by the way somebody else experienced this and I'm speaking that way because that's how I understood stories what they were meant to do what they're intended they were supposed to do right they're supposed to provide perspective and comfort to others and so I was always telling everybody I knew somebody that. And that was just my whole resolve. And I've always, after that, I just now as an adult consider myself a crazy storyteller. You know, I'm always telling stories, but they're not, they're not fictional stories, they're facts. And um, in high school, believe it or not, <laughs> I, wasn't very, I wasn't very, I wasn't that talkative. Not as much as I am now. 
Um, in high school, I was very timid, a very scared little girl in some sense. I was afraid of people's opinions. I, I didn't believe in myself. Oh my God, I did not believe in myself. I think I was, on some level, I was self-loathing. And uh, I just hated, hated with every fiber in my being. I hated being seen and heard. Like I just wanted to be a wallpaper. And um, when I came into grade nine, high school, you know, you're being challenged in different ways. But I, I had so much social anxiety that I planned. Like I was like, okay, I'm going to take these courses. You know, I'm not going to be the front and center. I can just blend in the background. And so I took, um, you, you had to either take band class in grade nine or you took drama class. And so I said, hell no, nah, drama. That sounds like monologues, a spotlight, a stage, and trauma. So in my head, I said, no, I'm definitely taking bad class because even if I play a trumpet, who even knows if I'm making a mistake? And it's about unification. It's about, you know, sounding all one. You know, like, it's not so singular. You know what I'm saying? So I was like, I can manage my anxiety in band class. So I said, I'm going to band class. So for, for whatever reason, I didn't get into band class. I got into drama because I because the blank the band class was full. Now you can imagine someone who's planned right to survive high school, right? Surviving high school I, that would be my <laughs> my documentary <laughs> surviving high school. This was not on plan, and, and and even the thought of it gave me a, like I was nervous. I was like, "There's no way. There's no way I'm taking drama class. No way. I had never seen the drama teacher. I never went near the drama class." I'm in grade nine, for God's sakes. I'm just trying to survive. I'm trying to just, you know, keep it moving. So I went to the guidance counselor. I said, Miss Ali, that was her name. I can't do drama class. I don't do drama class. She said to me, but it's it's good. It's good for your development, this, this, and that. Third. I said, that's nice, but I've always been into playing the <laughs> the trumpet. I'm a liar, okay? I've never played trumpet in my life. I've always wanted to play the trumpet. <laughs> She's like, really? I said, yeah, some people think that I'm the Kobe Bryant of trumpets. She looked at me, she goes, somehow I feel like you're just joking with me. I said, does it matter? Does it matter? Isn't that the point, like, that I want to do something, you know? And shouldn't you encourage that? And she's like, yeah, but I'm more curious about why you don't want to take drama class. I said, because it's just not my vibe. <laughs> Instead, like, it's not my vibe. And she's like, you know what? Okay, you know what? I'll do you solid. I'll go talk to the drama teacher, and I'll see what we can do about getting you into a band class. But I cannot make any promises. I looked at Glenn. I looked at Ali, Miss Ali, and I said, please. My life depends on this. She looked at me, and she goes, a little bit dramatic? I think you look like you're suited for drama class, to be honest. <laughs> I said, oh, my God, no. And so... I went home that day. My mom asked me, oh, how was your day? I said, today was a catastrophe, but I'm going to fix it tomorrow. She's like, why? I said, I got into drama class. Can you believe that? My mom goes, what's the difference? It's fine. Like, I don't know what the drama is about. I said, the fact that you said that. Anyways, I'm, I'm just going to go upstairs. So um, I thought about it all night. Kept me up. It was the most stressful night of my life. Felt like what anybody would feel like if they were doing their FCAT. <laughs> I was stressed. And then I came to uh, uh, to, uh, to class on Tuesday, and drama class was on my schedule. And I was like, you've got to be kidding me right now. And at this point, I don't have time to go see Miss Ali, so I have to go to the drama class and at least uh, make it for attendance, or they're going to mark me absent. I can get in trouble for that. So I go to drama class. First time, I walk down this hallway. It's, it looks like a real drama room. It has spotlights. The walls are dug. It's soundproof. I said, oh, no. <laughs> this place is too serious. I walk in. I see this woman with this really fire, like, engine red hair. She had glasses. She kind of looked like a mixture of a librarian and a yoga teacher, you know? Um, and uh, when she spoke, she was very, she spoke very clear. She was very personable. She was very, in your per like, I can't explain. She was very much, even though she's, like, five steps in front of you, she felt like she was in front of you. I don't know, her presence was very big. I come in, she locks eyes with me, I lock eyes with her, I, lock, I look away. 
I, you know, find a little spot in the dark, in the in the drama class, it's really dark where the spotlight's not hitting too much. <laughs> I sit there. And as I'm seeing people walk in, I notice that grade 12s are in this drama class. And I'm thinking, this is a grade 9 class. Am I in the wrong class? <laughs> and I'm looking, and so I asked the girl, but somebody said, hey, why are grade 12s here? She's like, oh, this is a combinational, like it's a merging class, meaning grade 12s can take this drama class. I said, you mean to tell me I'm in a class that's that's filled with grade 12s? I said, okay, I'm definitely not taking this this class. And um, because the idea of just being in presence of people who are older than me in a space where you're acting and you're, you know, acting outside of yourself and you're you're showing your vulnerability. I was like, there's no way. <laughs> Glenda says the first day we're going to read, and it's and I know what it sounds like. It sounds so corny, and it is. But I swear to God, this is two thousand and what seven. The first class we did was Romeo and Juliet. <laughs> I said, "No, this lady wants to kill me. She wants to kill me. This is what she wants to do." I said, "Romeo and Juliet, there's no way." So she goes, "Does anybody would like to come up?" I looked away. Okay, I said, "Uh, uh-uh, she better not." I looked away. She goes, hey, would you like to come up? She looks, um, I can see that she's looking at me. And it had, I had the audacity to look behind me. I'm like, there's no way she's talking to me, right? I said, there's no way. Um, because nobody ever noticed me, right, in rooms or ever. Like, it's just never a thing. So for her to point at me, I was like, somebody sent you. And I want to know who sent you. And so she's like, come up. I said, I'm just, no, 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 come up, come up, come up, come up, come up, come up, come up. She literally stands, extends her hands, helps me stand up. And then she goes, does anybody else would like to uh, join her? Would anybody like to join her? And nobody says anything. I want to die. I said, oh, God, just strike me now. She, she points out. She's like, no, it's fine. I'll do Romeo. You and I will do it together. I said, oh, my God. And so she gives me a line. She reads her line. I read my line. She reads her line. And then she, as she's we're reading the monologue, she's correcting me, right? She's saying, speak louder. You're not enunciating your words properly. You're slurring. Can you stand up straight? And it was just felt like I was under a spotlight. I could hear people chitter-chattering. And then she's also criticizing me at the same time. And I feel bare. And I remember just an overwhelming feeling over me of sadness and just humiliation, I dropped the book and I walked out. Like I literally, the most dramatic thing I probably could do in my ever in my ever drama career was that moment. Was the dra- I don't I, until today I cannot reenact that 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 drama was that that walkout was real for me. You can't until the, you can't tap into that. So I walked down. I had a full on panic attack. Like like I've never had one before. So it was very. I felt like I couldn't breathe. I turned the corner, and you know like those people that like when they're having a panic attack, they're really loud, right? I was having a panic attack, and I didn't want nobody to know. So I was holding my breath. That's like, that's a level of like, I didn't want people to see me. That even if, like right now, and, and I know many people with social anxiety will, will relate to this. If I was in a movie theater in the dark, and I was choking on popcorn, fam, I'm choking in that popcorn. Nobody's going to know I'm choking in that popcorn, because there's no way... People are going to hear me go, <clears throat> like, in front of her. There's no way. Because the humiliation, for me, is bigger than my death. It's so bad. Now that I think about it, it's actually sick. But I just didn't want anybody to know nothing. Don't know I'm here. Don't know I existed. Like, Harry Potter, my favorite character, is the it's a cloak. You know the Im- magical cloak? The thing that just makes you disappear? Bruh, I wish that thing existed in real life because I swear to God. But anyway, she came after me. She chased me down. She found me. She looked at me. She put, she like I my I was turned around. She turned me around. She said, "Breathe in, breathe out." Okay, breathe in, breathe out. And then she said, and she looked at me. And she said, "I cannot imagine why you choose to be the supporting actress of your own movie." I remember that's exactly what she said. She's like, "You." or should be the main character, but you choose to be a supporting actress. Matter of fact, I'm afraid you might just be the extra, and I don't know why 
you would ever choose something like that. And I looked at her and I just could not understand. I, I Like, I understood what she was saying, but I was just, I was just so overwhelmed. And she just kept, she was smiling at me, but she was almost felt sorry for me. And I think she could understand where I was coming from. She said, you know what, go take a walk and come back and we're going to talk after class. Took a walk, came back, um, and she said to me, listen, I know you tried to drop this class, and I'm really urging you not to. I think you need it. I think you need to do this class. I think you need to come out of your shell. I think your shell is killing you. You know, and I think it's okay. It's okay to, you know, be afraid and stuff, but that's that's when it started. And after that, I went home reflecting on that for so long. I was like, what does she mean by that? What is that? What does that mean? And after that, I recognized that, like, I wasn't in life. I just wasn't, I wasn't a main character, you know? We all know what main characters move like. I didn't move like that. And so I wanted to change that, and so I decided to stick to drama. And not only did I stick to drama, I did it all four years of high school. And now I won't stop talking. You know, I just, I'm all over the place every day, giving some sort of lecture, giving people eye contact, projecting. You know, <laughs> and I really give credit that to Glenda um, because I feel like I think she taught me how to be performatively confident. But the inner work was something I had to do privately. I started to be a bit more comfortable speaking out. You know, I started to be a bit more comfortable with being uncomfortable and I was being challenged in that way. But after that, you know, I graduated high school. I was off to adulthood. I was like, okay, I'm going to university. I am going to be whoever I want to be. I'm going to be unapologetic. I, I gave myself all of these things. I said, yo, high school is dead and gone. You could reinvent yourself, yada, yada. And I was excited about it because I feel like I had, you know, put on these new pair of clothing, but it was time that my, my environment reflected that. You know, I felt renewed and different. I wanted to look and feel that. Um, and so I went to university thinking, you know, I'm going to get new friends. I'm going to find people that are more like-minded. During these times, by the way, I didn't wear hijab. I, you know, didn't pray Salah. I wasn't an outward Muslim like that. I was just a Muslim by name. Um, and when I went to university, before, the, the, you know, university in Canada starts in September, before university, I had traveled with my mother for three months. It was a gift for my mom for graduating high school. So I went on tour with her, Right. So I, I call it on tour because that's exactly what it was. Going from one country to another country, performing. But I'm, I'm sorry, that's a tour. You know what I'm saying? You just don't have a tour manager. You don't have all that. Fashion, but this is a tour. We call her the, uh, we call her the Mariah Carey of our household. She's a Barambra lady. And for those who don't know who that, what that is, is that she reads poems, right? Um, and uh, she recites them and they're very articulately put together. Their stories, their their praises, their all these kind of things. She's very talented at what she does. She travels internationally. She is free spirited. She talks to anybody and everybody. When she hugs you, she asks you to sit. Like she she doesn't want you to leave. You know when people just hug and they walk away? She'll hug you and she wants you to stay with her. <laughs> like, stay here. <laughs> I mean, she speaks Italian, right? She speaks Somali, she speaks English. She, when I, I remember, I thought I was free spirit, okay? This lady talks to everybody, everybody. I remember when I was going to Paris and I was on a boat. Like, there was this boat we went on to get to leave from London to Paris. My mom met uh, a young woman um, and she went up to her, sat with her, said, hey, here, have some tea, join me. <laughs> the woman looked at her and goes, yeah, let's, go, let's join. I was like, oh, like she's going to talk to anybody? And she just, they just bonded on their families and their struggles and they they gave each other advice and I was like my mom is interesting you know and I remember the first day I realized my mom was like popping I'll never forget was when a woman from Dubai and this, I remember this because George Bush was president he was president and he was he was playing in the background and then my dad answers a call and it says corrections facilities from like um, a, a, a all women's prison in Dubai okay and she's calling for my mother and she's telling my mom, thank you for, because my mom, apparently, like my mom had a few months before that had gone to Dubai to perform uh, uh, some of her 
poetry about it, about that particular family. Because Baram but happens during weddings when a man and a groom are getting married. And so she sings about both tribes or she talks about um, how, you know, you know, valuable these people are and what they've done for Somalia or for mankind and how esteemed they are just to praise the both families, couples that are, you know, that are unionizing um, into this mega, you know, family. But um, my mom, we would travel around the world to do it for peoples. Um, and I remember the woman uh, who called was thanking my mom for doing that for her family. And so she wanted to personally call my mom because she said the way that she did it She's like, I will never forget this. She's like, I felt as though the shame I had brought to my family for one night, they could forget that. And I don't know what she meant, you know, like shame or any of that case. I don't know what had happened, but she was telling my mom, you know, thank you for making my family, you know, appear as though they're this esteemed family, you know, despite the fact that she felt like she brought a lot of shame to them. And anyway, that's when I was like, okay, you got calls from the correction facility of Dubai. It says, you pop in. I said, what in the world? You know, and I've traveled with her before in 2011 when she was going to a few neighboring tribes, I mean tribes, new neighboring countries at the time. And I saw her and I saw how people interacted with her. I was so shocked. I said, she's just my mother. Sometimes I used to be embarrassed of it. I won't lie. Sometimes I used to be embarrassed of it. And everywhere she went, she always had people around her or people bringing attention to her. And and I think that came from my, my personal issues with being visible and just my own securities and so I'm just trying to hear blend and she out here standing out you can imagine right we're the opposite <laughs> and my mother could not stand me she used to say to me why are you like this I remember even as a child she said to me be selfish as a kid who tells a kid that in grade three be selfish but I think what my mom was referring to was that she knew I was the most selfless person I was basically a doormat and I'm not saying the self was in a good way. Self was in a bad way. My mom was afraid for me. She wanted me to have a backbone. She wanted me to have an identity, something, you know, to stand on. And I didn't have anything to stand on. It very concerned her. And she didn't understand where it came from. And she's like, your, your grandmother's not like this. The women in your life are not like this. Why are you like this? But she never said that to me. She just, her advice was surrounded that. Like, be strong. Be selfish. Speak loud. Be proud. <laughs> she wouldn't always say the same things, but... That's my mother. That's my mother. Pause. I know. The story is getting so good. But wait, I have a message for you that you're going to want to hear, okay? Have you been looking for an opportunity to reconnect your faith by building a relationship with the Quran? Or even learning Quranic Arabic? Or even getting your questions answered about different rulings? Well, let me tell you. The Ribat Academic Institute is an online program that provides traditional Islamic education for women by women. Yes, you heard me right. Islamic education for women by women. Yes, all the courses are taught by female scholars. Allah mabarak. You have you have a choice from over 50 courses ranging from sira to tajweed to fiqh and hadith. You can even take in classes like the nine names of Allah or purifying the heart, or the reflections from the Qur'an, and the lessons from the life of the Prophet wasallam, as well as a Mentorship Matters program on how to guide and support and help others. Ribat's online classes have been reconnecting Muslim women from all around the world with their faith and helping them reclaim their traditionally held leadership roles in Islamic scholarship, mentorship, and community care. All classes are held live online and recordings are posted after class. And the courses, guys, the courses are affordable. They're not expensive at all. They also provide country discounts and scholarships are available. Scholarships are available. So there's no reason why you shouldn't sign up. So if you're interested, visit Robata, that's R-A-B-A-T-A dot info, I-N-F-O forward slash T-D-S and register today. And so um, in that three months, I saw my mom how other people saw her. I only saw my mom how I saw my mom. But when I, when I crossed international lines, I'm here in Switzerland. I'm here in Paris. I'm here in Bahrain. I'm in here in Germany. I'm here in Dubai. My mom was, like, out here. People out here, like, chasing for her. Like, I was so shocked, you know? I was like, who are you? You know what I'm saying? But, you know, my mom was not new in this game. I remember when I went to Paris, the hotel we stayed in Paris, 
the hotel we stayed in, the the doorman and the admin person knew who she was. They said, Maria Bella, you're back. I said, back. <laughs> I said, my mom goes, yeah. oh, this is your daughter? He goes, yeah, it's my daughter. Wow. Your mom comes here every year. We look forward to her. She's our favorite guest, you know? And I was like, oh, my God, my, you live a life I don't even know about. You know, I, I used to travel often, by the way. Every year she always traveled. But I was, again, I always knew she was doing Brahma, but I didn't know she was leaving lasting impressions on people. I didn't know that. Dude, you could be in a, in a space and disappear, and people won't remember you for it. But this woman is make, going into spaces and then leaving, and people are looking forward for her return. For her return. Even non-Somali or, or non-Muslims, like everyone. Like, she just was a pleasant person to be around. And so... You know, I'm seeing my mom do this and be who she is unapologetically inspired me. I was like, wow, look, look at my mom. She's doing her thing. And um, she'd been doing her thing, you know, and it made me really proud of her. And, and then also made me point my finger, like, look at myself a little bit more introspectively. And then, yeah, and then um, I was supposed to go to Italy after spending a, a few weeks in uh, London. And my mom was like, yeah, we're not going to Italy anymore. I said, where are we going? She goes, we're going to go to Dubai. We're going to go to Islam. I said, what? Why? <laughs> she goes, because it's Ramadan. And I was like, okay, but hoy, we can be fasting in Italy. Like, it's not that serious. She's like, no, nah, sis, this is an important month for us. See, this is what, this is what I told, this is what I talked to your father about. We need to take you guys all back to Africa. <laughs> you know? And so my mom's like, but it's okay. We're going to go to Dubai. We're going to spend it with my sister. And you're going to enjoy Ramadan in a Muslim country. I was like, okay, whatever. Cool. And and as we were, like, getting on play, on goes, okay, here's Aba and Hijab. I said, do I have to really, like, wear this right now? She goes, do you want to be locked up in Dubai when you land? I said, excuse me? She goes, wal guhara, you're going to be arrested if you don't wear hijab and abaya. At the time, I had no idea my mom was capping. I didn't know she was capping, okay? Because, of course, I didn't, I've never, I never knew li- the, li- the life in, in the Khaliji countries. I had no idea, right? So mom was telling me whatever she can get me in a hijab and abaya, okay? She tried to coax me to it. I never worn hijab and abaya, right? That wasn't my reality. My, that wasn't my world. My parents wanted me to come to my own resolve about hijab. But then when they saw me not coming to they started getting concerned. They said, this girl is nearly 20 years old. She's still not wearing hijab. Whose idea was this? You know? <laughs> but um, when we, my mom thought, okay, maybe I can break the ice with her and just kind of push her. And I'm unfortunately started off with a lie, but it's okay. I forgive her. Um, and I put on the hijab and abai and I went on that plane. I felt nice in it. It was nice. I was like, okay, this is kind of cool. I land. I saw everyone that looked like me wore hijab and abai and it felt me more comfortable. I was like, oh, this this okay. This is nice. It's cool. Whatever. And I wore hijab and abai like, like I'd been wearing my whole life. It wasn't a problem for me. Um, which now looking back, I recognize that my issue with hijab and abaya wasn't itself. It was, I was afraid of other people's perception because when I was in an environment where people wore it, I felt good and I wanted to wear it. Again, it stems from this idea of not wanting to stand out, being too different, you know? So I spent Ramadan fasting and my mom, I spent, and everybody who knows Dubai, my entire trip in Dubai, I was in Sukh the the, the Arab Sukh area where all Somali people be chill out. Ugh. Bro, I know that place better than I know my block. That's how much I spent up and down, up and down. Me and the Stray Cats, we knew each other by first name. Me and the Stray Cats, yeah? First name basis, Harry, Bob, Jerry. Like, I was in there, you know? First of all, it was, it's like a, at first it looks like Las Vegas. You walk in, you see lights, and it's a long street. Um, but then w- when you go through the alleyways, like these little areaways to go in um, behind the, the stores, then you see, like, other stores, the other stories behind there are like people's own stores, their private stories. Some are small, some are big, some are, you know. Um, and the first stores you see in the front are the Dehab ones, the ones that sell gold. My mom spent a lot of time there because that's, you know, my mom, that's her people. You know, she's there and people knew her there. And like, and I was sitting there like, you know, everywhere was wet. It was hot. It was alleyways. I saw um, many migrant workers, you know, working in really difficult conditions i saw i remember there were people who were from india or pakistan speaking somali and i was flabbergasted you know this guy said to me kali kali dira lawatan dollar i said who in the what you're speaking somali what in the world i was shocked i had never seen somebody speak somali that wasn't somali you know and it was like these people you know they recognize that people somali people come here and they need to sell to them, and so they learn the language, you know? 
wow. And yeah, it was an experience, but it was also very like sad. I remember there was a time I walked, uh, I was tired of chilling in these stories with my mom. I went to go take a walk and uh, I saw this building, random building, um, that kind of looked a little rundown. Now that I think about it, it was so dangerous. I don't know what told me to go there, but I went inside of it and I went up the elevator, was it up the stairs? And it was dark, guys. Imagine a dark building that looks mad run down. I go in. I think I was looking for adventures. This is how I know I'm not normal. I went in and I saw like a hallway and it was dark and the light was switching and the ground was kind of muddy. And I was like, what is this building? And then as I walked in, I saw a door that had a light on. Like the door was open. So if I walked, I could see inside the home. So I'm walking and I look at a peak and I see bunk beds. I see like two, four, six bunk beds, right? And then I see people sleeping on the bunk bed and I see people sleeping on the floor. And they were women. And they they look like women that were from East Africa. Some of them look like they were from South you know, Southeast Asia. Like it was and I remember thinking, subhanAllah, I remember thinking at first like, Oh my god, this is this is not right. That people are working in the sun like this and then they live like this, disappear like this. I remember being so sad and dis disgusted by the realities of like how people were living and i remember they and subhanallah you know they saw me look at them but they didn't they didn't pay no mind you know like if somebody peeked into my house i closed the door they just were so exhausted didn't care they just saw me and i said hi and they said Sam, and i just walked out and i was like just sad at just what i saw and after that i kept reflecting about like the situation of people in dubai and i was like I was whenever I go to ghost stories, I was I saw people bagging things and taking people's cars and seeing how people what did we get tipped. I was just so shocked about how this country was, you know, the the poverty line was was so massive. People were really either living very wealthy or they were living very poor, and it's just it was something I never I've never seen that kind of poverty before. Right after that, you know, I went back home and my aunt lived in a really nice apartment near the airport. She had a housekeeper. And uh, she was 19 years old and she was from Ethiopia and her name was Amina. And she only spoke Arabic. Um, and I think she spoke a, a dialect from her country. And I didn't speak Arabic very well. All I knew was Ta'ala and Islam Alik. You know, that's one of the things I really knew. And uh, she was very sweet, very kind. I, I didn't like her cleaning my clothing. I said I'd clean it. She'd mop my room. I said, you're not mopping my room. I'll mop my own room. It was just me and my mom were very uncomfortable. Like, you know, and we tell her, listen, we can do it. And like, I remember she would cook afur. I would help. Like, I was so uncomfortable with the idea of her. Like, I was like, you are you are my age. You and I are the same age, you know? And so I just didn't feel comfortable with, like, her working by herself and stuff like that. So I'd work with her. I'd clean with her. She's very sweet. Um, and then one day in the last 10 nights, I was I stayed home for, like, a week. I think I just didn't want to go back to um, the silk after seeing those migrant workers like that. So I was like, I, I don't want to go back. And I just felt down. And one day she's like, hey, come with me. I'm going to go to the masjid, come with me. And I was like, you know what, let me go for an adventure. I went with her. And I remember she had dates. And we went to the masjid. It was a really rundown masjid. You could tell people that come here to pray are people that, like, work, you know? It wasn't, a, it wasn't like those luxurious mosques I saw on the highway or on the streets that had, like, these lights that looked like it was a movie premiere, you know? Um, it was just a really, you know, simple mosque, um, still, you know, a little, you know, rustic and stuff. I go in there. I see people lining up. At this point, I barely even know how to pray, you know, salah. Before I pray salah, we handed out dates together to people. And then when we did go in, we went feet to feet, and we joined the salah. And I remember this so prominently. I saw, I heard an old man crying. Because the place was like a dome. So if you whispered, you could hear it. It echoed. Right? Then the place was massive. It didn't even need a second mic for somebody to, saw, for somebody to say, Sami Allah bi Hamida. People could hear because the place echoed. And there was a man I could hear weeping, weeping, like wailing. I'm like, what is going on? Does, is that man needed help? Like, I was so shocked. I was like, is he okay? I'm thinking, in my salah, I'm thinking, Yo, there's something wrong. Maybe he's hurt. This and the third. Um, but he's wailing, and then he'd pause, and then you wouldn't hear him, and then he would cry again. Then he paused, and then I realized. Oh my God, this guy's crying because of what he's hearing. Because his crying would begin at certain points of the of the ayahs. You know, certain certain openings of verses, you could hear him well more than others. So, okay, I think he understands what's being said and he's being moved by it. And then I thought, oh my God, what is being said? What is being said? 
Why don't I know? And those questions started to keep going in my head. What is it he knows that you don't know? And when the salah ended, I was looking for him. I was like, I wonder if I'd recognize him. Then I saw this old man who had this long gray beard. And he was exiting the masjid. His thobe was like really light blue. He was His whole hair was white. His whole beard was white. He had a little kufi. He had a cane. And when he was walking, only reckon, the only reason I knew it was him was because his, his cheeks were extremely red. Really red. You could tell he was crying. And I was like, it might, it, it, this might be the man that I was hearing. And then as, as I walked away, he seemed so kind. He didn't look sad at all. You know, like it wasn't a face of somebody who was in despair. It was somebody in, his, in the, in like, I don't know, like he was in this euphoric sense. Like he, like he, he, he it's like when, you know when you see people go to therapy <laughs> and they come out? They seem relieved. You know, they cried. You know, they, you know, they got a lot off their chest, but they look lighter. It was as if he had, like, left all of his grievances in that musalla. And he felt lighter because of it. And I was like, and then I remember just thinking, what in the world? I go home. I think about it. Think about it. Two in the morning. I'm thinking about it. I'm <laughs> thinking about it. Staring my ceiling. Thinking about it. I'm like, yo, if an old man to that age is crying about something I don't understand, shouldn't I be concerned? That's like I'm thinking, shouldn't you be concerned? There's something they know that you don't know. And so I I could not shake that feeling that I was out of the loop, that as a Muslim myself, I didn't know nothing. And I had the audacity to call myself a Muslim, you know? And I didn't know what was going on. I didn't understand. I was going through this really, like, I guess... I, I think I was going through an awakening at that point. And I was asking myself so many questions, private questions. And the next day was no different. I woke up, my mom looked at me, she goes, you look like you didn't sleep. I said, no, oh, I mean, I'm tired. She's like, you look stressed, are you okay? I said, yeah, I'm fine. And then she goes, and my mom, you know, your mom knows you better than you know yourself. She's like, I, I feel like you're thinking a lot. What are you thinking about, Hoya? And I was like, oh, nothing. I was so shocked that she could see that, you know, I, my, my mind was elsewhere. After that, around before we broke our fast, Amina comes up to me and she says to me something, and I couldn't understand, my cousin Liban had to, not my cousin Liban Safra, my cousin Muhammad had to um, explain to me. He asked, she said, are you okay? And I, and I told her, I'm fine. And she goes, if you want to get closer to Allah, you want to feel better, you want to understand Pray two rakat, ba'd al-fajr, and ask Allah. That's all she said. And I was like, what is she saying to me? And I was looking at her, I was like, what? Like, what do you mean? She said, just pray two rakat. Talk to Allah. That's it. That's it. That's all she said. She didn't say, say this. She didn't say, say that. She didn't tell me how many, how many rakats were in fajr. I didn't even know. I had to Google, you know? And I wasn't going to ask my mom because my mom would have been ashamed. I didn't want to tell her. I would have been embarrassed. But she was saying, just ask. So I go to my aunt's room um, because my aunt wasn't home that night. I went to her room. I prayed to Rakaz. I sat there. I looked at myself. I said, what do I say? And then I thought, just talk to him. And I just did. I just, I spoke to Allah as if somebody was in front of me. And all I said was, Allah, I don't know what's going on, but I know that I don't know anything at all. And it sucks. And um, and I don't want to be confused. I want to know who I am. I want to know what I am. I want to know what is it that I believe in. I want to know you. I want to know what was being said. I want to feel peace. I want to be the person that I, I want to be, you know? And I, I just don't know. And I literally said, I remember, Allah changed my circum, like, change my circumstance. I don't know anybody. I don't, I'm not friends with Muslims. I'm not... Friends with people who wear hijab. I don't like. I'm not. I'm not. I'm. I'm not in any place. I'm go back to Canada. Like I, I don't know a new life. I don't know any other life. And I said that, and I was so sincere because that's my reality, you know. And I said, if Allah, if you're true and your promise is true and you exist, change my circumstance. You know, change my circumstance. It's like, a, and I remember I spoke to him in a very challenging way. Like, change my circumstance. Like, help me because I I can't I can't get out of this. I don't know. Where am I supposed to learn? Where am I supposed to go? You know? And that was the last 10 nights. SubhanAllah. 
Um, you can imagine how important the last ten nights are. Who even knows? Maybe the day that I was doing it was later to Qadr. I don't know, you know. But I know that day was pinnacle of my. That was that is the only dua I can say what with my chest, God accepted. With my ch- how many duas that we remember get accepted by Allah? Like you saw it either immediately or later, or you even remembered that was a dua that was accepted that you asked. That one I remember as as if it was yesterday because the the quick change was just un, it was un it was scary. You know what I mean? Like it, it really scared me because I came back home. I took off the hijab. I took off the abaya. I went to first year university. And within the uh, the month of November, I had met women who wore hijab, abaya, who are Ghana. And now they weren't just regular Muslim women. They were women who were practicing their religion. That's different, right? There were women that had something to say. And so I became friends with them. Then I felt in t- I felt encouraged to wear hijab, right? So then I was wearing hijab and jeans for a week or two. It was so weird. It was like two weeks. Then I was wearing hijab and a skirt. And then by December, I was wearing jilbab. It was like, and I'll never forget the day my dad saw me wear hijab. He cried. He cried. He was so shocked. He said, I don't know what got you to this point, but I, I praise Allah SWT. I had never seen my dad cry before. You know, and he and he was overjoyed. He didn't know that moment would come. I think that's something that he was very, you know, subhanAllah, our parents, they worry about things we don't even see it on them. I never knew my dad was worried about that, about my my sense of spirituality and my relationship. I didn't know he worried about that. But he I guess he did a lot. Um, and after that, like, you know, I hit the ground running and now I'm a completely different, I would say I'm a completely different person. That was like, what, nine years ago? And so Amina, Glenda, my mother, my grandmother. And then even after that, until today, I continue to meet women that have something to tell me. Something to help me refine my character. Something to encourage me to go here, to go there. It's like they were like, they were at every checkpoint. And it makes sense because my dua during the last 10 nights in Dubai that night was about sisterhood. I was asking Allah for companions. I was asking for women. I was, I was asking that. I was like, Allah, I need, I need women like me. I want to change my circles, but I need help. All of a sudden, I'm meeting women. I think in that year, first three year, first year, wallahi, in that first year I started practicing, I think I met over 200 people. Who meets 200 people in one year? That's how many people I met. I met so many people in a single year. And I continue to all the time. Thankfully, because I have a mom that teaches me to, it's okay to talk to strangers and it's okay to be open, you know? I never felt reserved to, you know, I was very open, very welcoming. I was always interested in, um, you know, listening to people and meeting new people, always interested in making friends. And my experience has never haunted me not to, you know? Every new person I meet, Every new person I meet, I ask myself, what is it I'm going to learn from them? What is it they're going to tell me? Do they have something from me, from Allah? Like, is there something they're going to tell me? Are they a means for me? The reason why sisterhood means so much to me is because my building of my connection with Allah was through people. I felt close to Allah through people. The first time I was ever learning about Allah was through people. People were telling me about Him. Allah is this, Allah is Ghafur Rahim, Allah is that, Allah is this. It was remarkable and... And now I feel debted to it, like the whole idea of sisterhood, like I'm debted to it. Like I, my whole life, I want, I want to encourage women to help one another, love on each other because it's so powerful. Oh my God, my God, is it powerful? It's so powerful and so underrated. I give so much to it and part of my story, a big part of it is sisterhood. What is it that I want this podcast to turn into? I want it to be an experience. I want people to feel sisterhood. I want you to hear my voice and feel as though I sound familiar. I want people to feel comforted. I want people to feel seen. I want people to feel heard. I want people to feel related to the stories. I want women who might feel like they live, you know, they might feel like they don't have anyone. They don't know any women or 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 live in their proximity but they can go on they can go on their uh, phones search for this podcast and boom they're in a gathering they're listening to a story by a sister and it's inspiring and it's relatable and i feel as though i'm there and i feel comforted i feel renewed i feel close to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that's how i want people to experience this podcast i want everyone to feel like you're in this halaqa with me 
You know, I want people to feel that. I want people to feel like I'm their friend and every speaker that comes on here is talking to them personally because they are. Our stories are personal. Personal advices, you know, they're pers- they're personal to everybody because my grandmother told me stories to comfort me. She wanted me to be connected to the content. And then I used the same stories to comfort others, right? So you can feel this camaraderie. This, I can't even say the word. You feel this commonality. You feel this sisterhood. You feel this brotherhood. You feel all of these things with this person because of the story they shared. You don't know nobody until you hear their story. And so if I'm on a podcast telling you stories of all these incredible women, I'm hoping that you feel connected. You feel loved. You feel seen. And that these stories you can take to comfort somebody else. عذر ما حموه دلاها او عذا يا بهجلن اله وعير كي يا دول كباها عيد الله وقاديه عراضا مهشه اي تقتناها عافي ما يادكو سي وعبادا وانا هكسانيه عافي ما ياد بسي يا عرور تهيد الروح حيس عها شغان عدلوه ويه بربيه يوعيريه رهقلي hey. Yes, I made a very amateur mistake. I did not record an outro. Now I'm recording from my phone underneath my blanket hoping that it's soundproof and that you don't hear any of my siblings arguing about tuna sembus like i would hate if you heard them arguing about stuff like that so um i would like to do an outro now this episode okay let me hold on let me put on my <clears throat> my marketing voice <clears throat> this episode is brought to you by beautiful light studios <laughs> okay so i need to start taking my life serious <laughs> beautiful, beautiful light studios I think I, I think that'll do, right? I think that'll do. I'd also like uh, to give a shout out to our producer, the brains of all of these episodes, this entire project, my producer, my friend, super talented, Muna Sheikh Omar from all the way, Minneapolis, Minnesota. God, I'd clap for you, Muna, but I'm holding a phone in my hand and I'm underneath my busta and it's just a lot going on. But you already know how I feel about it. I'd also love to give a shout out to all of the sponsors that sponsored each episode. You knew it was important that these stories needed to be heard. You guys are the real superheroes. And I'd also, oh, I'd also like to invite, um, if you're interested in sponsoring an episode, because we do record live in really, you know, expensive studios, for goodness sakes, I don't even want to tell you how expensive it is. Haraki Adim. If you're interested in donating, whatever, to help us get these stories out, shoot us an email, a message, whatever you um, can reach us at and let us know that you're interested in donating. That would be super dope. And I'd also love to invite people that possibly might have wonderful stories, incredible stories. I know that I don't know everybody with great stories, you know, and I'm inviting everyone that's listening that if you have an incredible story that you believe, you know, and I know it. All stories inspire others. But if you have a story that you're comfortable with sharing that inspires others, I encourage you to share them and maybe even possibly allow us to help you share that story here on the Digital Sisterhood podcast. How do you, how do you end it, outro? Um, yeah, okay. I'll see you guys next next week. Yeah? Cool, okay. I, I'll see you guys next episode. Inshallah. And I really hope that you loved this episode and that you're looking forward to the next episode. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.